in lesson, is this lesson three? three. Mm -hmm. I was going to say lesson eight since it's number four. four. <laughs> lesson four. Yeah, really. Let's just call it eight. <laughs> the new beginning of Noah. Good things happen in Genesis chapter eight. Um, you know, we talk a lot about numbers in scripture, and we have to understand that the meaning of numbers doesn't just come from a random definition that someone came up with. The meaning of numbers is derived from scripture. It's derived from the Hebrew alphabet. It's derived from the Psalms. Um, and another way that we can understand the meaning of numbers is through the book of Genesis. Genesis is an alphabetic book or an alphabetic book. So if we want to get an understanding of what the number one represents, we can read Genesis 1. What is two, three, four represent? We can read the corresponding chapters. So in Genesis 8, we can look at the themes represented by the number 8. And so the first thing we're going to talk about there is the list of the meanings of the number 8. Number 8 is connected with renewal, a new beginning, restoration, or a return to the beginning. And that's what we're going to see here in Noah's experience. So notice first that in Genesis 8, how many people were saved from the flood? Eight. Eight. And the New Testament comments on that. It says eight souls were saved from the flood. These eight souls went into the new world, right? They were in the old world. They were saved on the ark, lifted up above the flood, and they are the ones that emerged from the ark to live and replenish the earth. So those eight souls represent this new beginning. Whenever a, a male child is born, the Levitical law requires that he's circumcised. What day is he supposed to be circumcised on? Day eight. Day eight. And there are physical reasons for circumcising a child on day eight. And there's also, our nurse Shirley can tell us, right? That's when the... the, the when, you blood, when their blood can clot. When their blood can clot. It's Ooh. the optimum time for that. So it has a price. Now, they didn't know that mm -hmm. in Moses' day. God just said circumcise, circumcise the child on day eight. Um, so the number eight has to do with um, a, a cutting away of the old nature, the old flesh, and a renewal. And specifically, it, it's the best day physically for a child to be circumcised. David, who was a foreshadow of Christ, was the eighth son of Jesse. Remember when Samuel was looking to anoint a son of Jesse, he examined the, the seven older brothers and he said, no, nope, he's not here. Where's the other one? And David was out in the field. He was the youngest son. He was with the, uh, the sheep and he was the one chosen to be king. Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, is an eight-day feast. Right? There are seven days of feasting, followed by the eighth day, which is the last great day. And that feast represents the new beginning, specifically that eighth day. It's a return to the beginning. Um, now, here's something that I haven't said before. Let's see if you can get what this means. Jesus was raised from the dead on the what day? Eighth day. The eighth day. Normally, we say what? Third. Third day. He was raised from the dead three days after the cross, right? He died on the cross on Passover, he was in the tomb on unleavened bread, and he was raised from the dead on the day of first fruits, which is the third day, right? However, it was also the eighth day. What day of the week did he raise from the dead? Sunday. Sunday, right? Sunday is a new beginning of the week, right? It's the seventh day, but it's also the eighth day. Well, no, I'm sorry, did I say that right? So the first day of the week, Sunday, Come back around, go to the uh, Sabbath day, which would be Saturday. The following day is Sunday. That's the beginning of the next week. So it's the first, first day, but it's the eighth day since the last week. Right. Did you get that? Yes. yes. We've talked about this before with notes on a musical scale. There's seven notes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then the next note is A again. So the eighth note is the same note as the first note. It returns to that same tone, but it's of a higher pitch. So it's in perfect harmony with that first note. So Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday, which is the first day of the week, or the eighth day since his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So you can even see that new beginning, that resurrection day on the eighth day. Another thing we talk about often is uh, the millennia of history given to mankind. We say there's 6,000 years of human history followed by in the 
seventh millennium, the reign of Christ for a thousand years on the earth. But then what happens after that? What happens when that millennial reign is finished? That's when we enter into the new beginning or the eternal state, which is celebrated in Revelation 21. So we could say the eighth millennium, if time even works the same way at that point, represents a new beginning. So in the same way, in Genesis 1, we read about creation. Everything is being formed, and God is making the sun, moon, and stars, and the plants and animals, and mankind upon the earth. He's creating everything on the first day according to his power. Then we can see the earth being destroyed in Genesis 7, but then there's a new beginning in Genesis 8. So you see that recreation um, as Noah and his family emerge from the ark. So the number eight is all about renewal, a return to the beginning, a starting over, which don't we need that like every day, right? Mm -hmm. Every single day. So let's go to Genesis chapter eight, and we're going to start with just the first verse. So someone please read Genesis eight, one. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. So how is it that God made the water subside? The wind. With a wind, right? That's why we don't have any water in your <laughs> <laughs> We've got exactly. plentiful wind. The wind is a picture of the Holy Spirit, so we'll say that's a good thing. Right? Oh, that's right. So God uses a wind to cause the waters to recede from the earth. Now, let's we're talking about Genesis 8 as a new beginning. Right? Noah and his family are going to be emerging from this watery destruction into a newly dried earth. And God is using a wind to cause the waters to recede. If we go back to Genesis 1, specifically Genesis 1-2, at the beginning, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You see that? So in Genesis 1... The Spirit of God is hovering or moving upon the face of the waters. And here we have renewal, Genesis 8, the wind causing the waters to recede. So again, it's that theme of new beginning. But looking at the connection between the wind, the spirit, the water, and the dove, all of those are related. Exodus chapter 14, whenever uh, Moses splits the sea or when God divides the Red Sea, it says, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. So God parts the waters of the Red Sea to deliver his people through to the other side, and he uses an east wind to do that. So the wind moving upon the waters, again, is a picture of the, the power of God, the power of the Spirit. We see the connection between the dove and the water in the cleansing of the leper from Leviticus 14. We've talked about this several times, but let me just uh, remind you. The cleansing of the leper is a really interesting ceremony. In the first part of the ceremony, there's two doves, right? Uh, one dove is sacrificed over running water or fresh water or specifically translated living water. One dove is sacrificed over living water. And a second dove is dipped into the blood of the first dove. And this ceremony also calls for cedar wood, a hyssop branch, and a scarlet thread. So we put all of those things together, cedar wood, a scarlet thread, the hyssop branch, the sacrifice of the dove over living water, the dipping of the second dove into the blood of the first dove and his release. We see the theme of the cross there. But what I want you to think about specifically is the bird over the water. We're talking about the Spirit of God hovering over the waters in Genesis 1 before creation. We're looking at the wind over the waters of the flood as he causes them to recede. And in Leviticus 14, um, reading the bowl, Then the priest shall command that one of the birds be slaughtered over fresh water in a clay pot, and he is to take the live bird together with the cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop and dip them into the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. The dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit, as we'll confirm with some other scriptures here. But a dove being slaughtered over the water 
is another picture of the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. And the second dove is dipped into the blood of the first dove and then released. So oftentimes, when the Spirit is being communicated, it's done so as wind over water, or a dove over water, or a bird over water. Um, Jonah chapter 1, verse 15. Let's see if you can see the connection here. It says, At this, they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the raging sea grew calm. How does that relate to the Spirit of God or the wind or a dove over the water? Anybody remember that little piece of trivia? <coughs> so, remember the, the, the wind was whipping up the, the ocean. Right? Absolutely, yeah. And, and they threw Jonah over because he disobeyed God, and when they just threw him over, then it pacified the water. Yes, that's a really good answer. I didn't even think about that. So, good point. The wind was churning up the waters, causing the storm whenever they threw Jonah over. Um, but also, Jonah in Hebrew means what? Yeah. Dove. Oh, yeah. Jonah. There's no j in Hebrew. Jonah. It means dove. His name literally means dove. So as the wind is churning up the waters of the storm, and they throw, just, just imagine for a minute like a freeze frame. They throw Jonah into the sea that's churned up by the waters, and just for a minute the dove is over the water. And the dove, Jonah, causes the waters to be still. So in the same way that the cleansing of the leper ceremony causes that new beginning, that clean flesh for the, the leper, Jonah thrown into the sea solves the problem, right? The, the sailors were saved. They um, were spared from the sea as Jonah goes out over the water. Um, and most importantly, Matthew 3.16. Here's how we really understand that the dove in Scripture is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.16 as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. So imagine Jesus coming up out of the water and the Spirit of God descends like a dove over him and over the water. So again, you see the dove, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Just like in Genesis chapter 1, and in the same way that the wind is driving back the floodwaters in Genesis chapter 8. The Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And then finally, you can even see this in John 6, 12. When they had rowed about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So Jesus is walking out on the water. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and he is hovering or walking upon the water. So the wind driving back the water of the flood, which by the way, the water of the flood buried the sin. Remember the Nephilim, the wicked men, the violent men, they were buried in the flood and cleansed away. And Noah and his family were delivered and they emerge out into a new beginning. So we're going to see the theme of baptism here. In the ark, we see the cross in the flood, we see the baptism, and after the flood, we see uh, the wind over the water, and we know Noah's going to release a dove here in a little bit in the rest of the chapter. We see the presence of the Spirit. So even in the story of the ark, God is teaching us about Jesus, his uh, birth, uh, life, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, what he did for us, that we may be uh, sanctified and set apart as holy as well. So that's verse one, right? Let's read in Genesis chapter eight, verses two through six. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the hundred and fifty days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The, the waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened up a window he had made in the ark. Okay. 
So in addition to the wind passing over the earth, causing the waters to as you age, how was the water restrained? The fountains of the deep were closed and the floodgates of the sky were closed. Right. The fountains of the deep were closed and the floodgates of the sky were closed. So you can hear the water that came up from below and the water that came down from above, that stopped and restrained. So the water is no longer coming upon the earth. Right, Wanda can sing, the blood came up, the rain came up. Right? Um, so the, the judgment from beneath, the judgment from above, the waters that were, that were used to create the flood, those are stopped and restrained. Now, again, we're looking at a new beginning here in Genesis chapter 8. This is recreation. If we go back to creation in Genesis chapter 1, remember on day 2 of creation, God separated the waters above from the waters below? It's almost like he knew what was coming and he was planning for it, right? He was reserving those waters for the judgment that was to come. And even Job talks about that, the book of Job. Have you seen the storehouses of hail that the Lord reserves for the time of judgment? And we read about hail like fire mingled with blood in the book of Revelation. So those judgments are reserved for a specific time. But on day two, God separated the waters above from the waters below. And here, they have been stopped, so there's no more flood. The judgment is complete. Um, and again, that reminds us of day two of creation. At the end of 150 days, it says the waters were abated. 150 days. If we use a 30-day month, a 30-day prophetic month, which is usually the conversion factor in prophecies like Daniel's 70 weeks or the 1,260 days of Revelation, 30 days makes a month. Um, so 150 days would be five months. five months, right? What other major trial in the Bible is over at the end of 150 days? Remember this one? No, I don't know. Sierra, help us out here. <laughs> He's like, who, me? <laughs> Revelation 9, it's on your notes. Remember the locusts that come out of the abyss? How long are they permitted to torment those that don't have the seal of God? Five months. Remember that? So here we have um, a judgment referring to 150 days with the waters in Genesis 1. At the end of the Bible in Revelation, we've got the judgment from the locusts, which come up out of the abyss and down onto the earth. They're given 150 days or five months to torment the men that do not have the seal of God or that protection on their forehead. Christian. Um, in Africa, they're facing the worst locust problem that they've ever seen yeah. before right now. Yes. It's so bad, like they can't, it's like dense fog. Like they can't see more than six inches in front of them or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have y'all seen the pictures? I have not. Yes, it's crazy. And they're decimating the crops, which means that a large population of people have their food supply being threatened. Um, the locusts, in combination with the peace plan, in combination with the coronavirus, the fires, the earthquakes in the, in the Bahamas last week, all of those things happening at once, you can see we've been talking about birth pangs for a long time. I can hear Phil sitting in the back row saying, this is the birth pangs, right? They're getting closer together and they're getting more intense. I mean, it's just normal to hear that on the news now. Oh, there's an earthquake here. There's a volcano here. Coronavirus is breaking out. Zika virus, MERS, SARS, you know, it's, it's just common <coughs> news nowadays. And so the birth pangs that Jesus describes in Matthew 24, are getting closer and closer together and getting more intense over time. Jim? Kind of in line with what he said, uh, the vultures over there had had one egg a year forever. And right now they're saying they're hatching three, four, five eggs at a time. Mm. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. To take care of all the dead. 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 Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And the and the battle of Gog and Magog you're talking right. about the well yeah and then in Revelation it talks about the vultures feasting on the flesh yeah. of yeah. kings and horses. Yeah, and so we can see those things happening. And we look at Noah's flood as an example or prefigure from the coming for the coming judgment. We're seeing signs of those things. Um, so it's 
never been a better time to get your heart right with God and do everything you possibly can to spread the gospel. I was taking a semester of Calculus 3 probably last five months, too. (laughs) A time of trial and suffering? (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) That's a good one. I love it. Definitely. So the five months, it's just a time of of trial. Um, And in that 150 days, Noah and his family were safe and protected. In the 150 days of the locusts in Revelation, the 144,000 are sealed and protected. They are safe from that judgment. And if we want to take it even further, if we look at John the Baptist, what does this have to do with John the Baptist? He ate locusts, right? He ate locusts, right? He was filled with the Spirit. He ate locusts and wild honey. And remember his mother hid her pregnancy? How long did she hide her pregnancy? Five months. Five months. Isn't that interesting? The Bible is so consistent. It just repeats itself over and over and over because it takes us a long time to learn it, right? We have to keep repeating it over and over. Um, and when John the Baptist baptized, the dove came down. Yes. So. Yes. And there's the dove over the water at Jesus' baptism. At Jesus' baptism, it's an amazing illustration of the Trinity. You have the sun in the water. You have the Spirit of God hovering over the water, over Jesus like a dove, and you hear the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. So you can see it just all um, presented there in that beautiful picture of of Christ coming up out of the water. And I was listening to Derek Gilbert. I don't know if y'all listen to him or not. He's he's, a teacher on YouTube. He's on Skywatch TV. And he was explaining that every time a believer is baptized, every time a believer goes under the water and emerges up out of the water, it's a testimony um, proclaiming to, remember the the flood was a judgment on the fallen angels for what they did with the Nephilim, is proclaiming to them, we are coming up out of the water, right? We are making it through this judgment. Um, The baptism is a, the flood is a picture of baptism and a believer emerges from underneath that water, like Jesus emerged from that water, into that new life, into, like it, like we say to our church, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life, right? Walking into that new beginning. Now, you ready for some uh, time trivia? Sure. When did the ark come to rest? This is chapter 8, verse 4. The seventh month, the seventeenth day. Seventeenth day of the seventh month. Okay, the seventh month is going to be springtime, right? How do we get that? Well, if we fast forward to Exodus, during the Passover, right? Whenever God delivered Israel out of Egypt on the Passover, he said, this is going to be the beginning of months for you. Previously, it was the seventh month. God made a change, and he said, this is going to be the first month. This is the new beginning for you as you emerge from Egypt, pass through the Red Sea, and head towards the Promised Land. So the seventh month that's referred to in Genesis for the flood is actually in the springtime, during the time of Passover. It's the month of Nisan. What happens on Nisan 17? What's the 17th day of the first month on the religious calendar? Do we know? Is it Passover? Passover? Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, right? Passover is the 14th day. The first fruits is the 17th of Nisan. So you can look on your little calendar there, right? So Nisan 1 up here, that's the first month. This is the month that's being referred to in Genesis as the seventh month. Okay, so let's consider the implications of this. The ark comes to rest in the seventh month. The 17th day of the month as described by Genesis. Later in Exodus, God says the seventh month is now going to be your first month. That allows us to make the connection that the ark comes to rest on the day of first fruits. Do you see how important that is? The ark makes it through the judgment of the flood and comes to rest on the day of first fruits. What's important about the 17th day of of Nisan? Well, of course, the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat. 
Some theologians say that that was also the day that Moses parts the Red Sea. I'm unsure about the timing there. I don't know if they made it out and got it through the sea in, in three days, but some suggest that. This is the Feast of First Fruits. Um, this also is the day that the Israelites first eat the fruit of the Promised Land after crossing Jordan. Okay, so remember Israel under Joshua is getting ready to go into the Promised Land. It's just before the Battle of Jericho, and God splits the water and brings them through the water. And then on the day of first fruits, the day of unleavened bread is when the manna stops. And then on the day of first fruits, they eat the first meal from the grain of the promised land. So on the day of, of first fruits. And then they go in and they take Jericho. Okay, so there's that pattern there. Esther's fast ends on the 17th day of Nisan. And Esther then goes on to deliver her people. But what's most important is that Jesus rose from the dead on the day of first fruits. Right? So isn't it interesting that the ark, which is a picture of the cross, coming through the floodwaters, the judgment, um, finds its rest on the resurrection day? Because eventually Noah and his family are going to emerge from the ark, and we know it was on the day of first fruits that Jesus rose from the dead. I also think it's fascinating if we go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, on day three, what happens? God gathers the water and makes the dry land. And on that dry land, he causes vegetation to grow. Um, and we've talked about the rock, the land coming up out from the water as a picture of resurrection. And Noah's Ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat because it had been exposed from underneath the waters of the flood. So when the Ark comes to rest, the land looks a lot like it did on day three of creation. So again, we have that renewal, we have that return to the beginning. Um, and then it goes on to give us some more time clues. Um, what did it say that Noah did 40 days after he saw the tops of the mountains? Release the bird. Let's see. A raven. He opened the window of the ark. There we go, verse so six. He opened up the window of the ark, right? Verse 6, it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. So there was a window in the top of the ark. He opened it up 40 days after they saw the tops of the mountain, right? Well, what happened 40 days after Jesus' resurrection? He ascended. He ascended, right? They had to open a window for him to go up through, right? So I think that's also very interesting. So let's read about the raven and the dove. Genesis chapter 8. I need a reader for verses 7 through 12. And he sent out the raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove <coughs> could find nowhere to perch because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again set out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. Okay, so Noah opens up the window and he sends out the raven and it doesn't return. And then he sends out the dove three times over, right? And the third time it, it finally leaves. But again, there's that picture as he releases the dove, the dove over the water. And the waters of the flood are like the picture of the waters of baptism. And you've got the dove over that like we saw at Jesus' baptism. But let's talk a minute about the raven. Um, Noah opens up the window and he sends out a raven first. According to the law, do you know, is a raven a clean or an unclean bird? It's unclean. Unclean. It eats carrion, right? It feasts on the flesh of the dead. So the law classifies the raven as an unclean bird. And we know God told Noah, bring clean and unclean onto the ark. Whenever he releases the raven, what does it do? 
just flies to and fro, right? It doesn't have a place to rest. It just flies to and fro, but we're not told that that raven ever returns. If we think about this, it's similar to Cain. We're going to contrast the carnal nature from the new spiritual nature. If we look at Cain, um, after he murdered his brother Abel, what was his punishment? To wander. To wander. He had to leave. He had to wander. He had to become a nomad, moving from place to place, never quite finding rest anywhere, always worried for his life because of what he had done to his brother Abel. Genesis 4.14 said he was going to be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. So Cain is going to wander. John teaches us in the New Testament that we should love one another and not live according to our old carnal natures. 1 John 3.12 says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. So Cain was wicked. His punishment was to wander restlessly, as a nomad, a fugitive, and a vagabond. And we can see that in the symbolism of the raven. It's released, and it flies to and fro without any rest. Again, we're considering the flood as a type of baptism. And so what that raven represents is the old nature leaving, that carnal nature and fleshly nature leaving and going away permanently after baptism. Peter teaches about this in uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21. He says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, now figure means example, foreshadow, type. The flood is a figure wherein to even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, not the external cleansing, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the flood washed away all of the wicked, and then Noah sends out the raven. That unclean bird doesn't return. In the same way, when we accept the work that Christ did on our behalf on the cross, and we are baptized, that old nature goes away, right? And we receive the gift of the Spirit uh, because of that. So if you look at the pattern, there's the cross, a believer accepts the cross, the believer is baptized, and the believer receives the Spirit, right? Now, I think the moment we believe, we receive the Spirit, and physical baptism is just a, a demonstration of what's going on on the inside. But we have the ark, we have the flood, and we have the dove. Right? The cross, the baptism, and the spirit. And we can even see this in the tabernacle as we walk through the tabernacle. First we encounter that altar of burnt offering. That's a picture of the cross. Then we encounter the laver. That's a picture of the baptism. And then we press on into the holy place and the most holy place where the presence of God is, where the spirit of God is. So on page three, we could say in a similar way, when a believer trusts in Christ and demonstrates this through baptism, the Holy Spirit causes his old nature to leave. Let's look at some verses that illustrate this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. The raven leaves, doesn't return, right? Behold, all things are become new. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. Get rid of the raven, right? Get rid of the old man. And then later on, put on the new man. Receive that dove. Receive the spirit. Colossians 2.11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So the cleansing that baptism represents is really deep inside of us, in our hearts, in our spirits. Baptism is just a, a physical picture of that. Remember, circumcision had to be on the eighth day, and that's always a picture of a new beginning. So when we accept the cross, when we are baptized, when we receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit, we are a new creature, a new creation. Um, so Noah then sends out the dove, and it comes back the first time. 
Then he sends it out a second time. What does it bring back the second time? A twig. The twig, the olive leaf, right? It probably had olives on it. Um, so he brings back the branch of the olive tree and then he sends it out the third time and it doesn't return. What does the olive leaf represent? Renewal. Renewal, yeah. Oh. Renewal? Vegetation. <coughs> like if you see it on the flag of a country or something like that, what does it represent? Peace. Peace. This is where it comes from, right? Peace. And the olive branch. And the olive branch, Extend right? The olive branch. Extend the olive branch, right? The dove, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, brings that olive branch. The Spirit is what brings us the peace. And if we look at the olives, um, the way that the oil is extracted is by crushing the olive. Right? When Jesus was crushed on the cross, he then later gives his spirit. He gives us the oil of his spirit because of his crushing. Um, and think about Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. So we see that dove, a picture of the Holy Spirit, bringing the olive branch back into the ark, saying, you are at peace. The old nature is gone. When the spirit comes, that's when we have the peace, the peace with, with God and all of the other fruits of the Spirit. We know Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now, I've thought about this a lot, and I don't really know the answer, so I'll ask you, and then I'll give you a hypothesis. Is there any significance to the dove being released three times? I mean, there's time clues. He releases it. He waits a certain amount of time. He releases it again. The giving of the dove, or the sending out of the dove three times. What do you think? Third time's job. <laughs> That's where that comes from. Jesus was there two for three days. Oh, yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity. That's a good one. Representative of the Trinity. Well, they're all good answers. Absolutely. Um, okay. They just kind of fall uh, off to the side a little bit. But I was thinking about the raven. Mm -hmm. When he when released the raven, uh, he flew back and forth. They kicked Satan out of heaven. What did he do? Wandered back and forth on the earth, wrecking havoc. And if you know anything about ravens, that's all they do is wreck havoc. Wow, <laughs> good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and ravens are really smart. Yes, they are. And wise and- And so is Satan. Tricky. Yes. Believe me. Tricky. Yes, <laughs> cunning and- Hard to kill. Witty, yeah. yeah. Feasting on dead things. Yeah, really good point. <laughs> so I was thinking about the doves. If we think about God sending out his spirit, um, of course, the moment a, a, a believer comes to Christ and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they are saved. And to be saved means to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and that happens at various times a day, every day. But there are three distinct events in Scripture that are really set apart that mark the giving of the Spirit. The first one, I think, is at Jesus' baptism. We see the presence of the dove over Jesus, and Jesus is the first fruits of all creation. He is the firstborn from among the dead. The second major event that we can think about as the outpouring of the Spirit is at Pentecost. Jesus ascends. Ten days later, he gives the Spirit at Pentecost. They are the first fruits of the wheat harvest, right? The first fruits of the church. And then a third time in the book of Revelation, the pouring out of the Spirit on the 144,000. They are sealed in their foreheads. The 144,000 are the first fruits of the, the fruit harvest or the grape harvest. So you can even see those distinct events of marking the pouring out of the Spirit at the times of the first fruits. So Jesus, church at Pentecost, and the 144,000. Now, I don't think just because you weren't there on that day, you don't, you're don't you prevented from receiving the Spirit. It's just those are marking the first fruits of, of the harvest. So Noah sending out the dove three times may be related to that. Um, but the prophets talk about the former rain and the latter rain. Uh, Joel talks about pouring out his Spirit on all flesh in the latter days. And again, there are distinct events that commemorate that. When Noah removes the covering, what do you think he saw? So he opened the window first, he sends out the birds, and then he removes the whole covering of the ark. When he removes the covering, what did he see? Sunshine in the sky. Yes, sunshine. And it was a different sky. Right. Because of the rain now. Right. Because of the rain, it's different. Blue, 
Yeah, if you've ever heard of the canopy theory, the why did men live so long is because it was like a greenhouse because there was that layer of moisture and that was released on the earth during the flood so it looked different. You know, when we were talking about the new thing that started and when they think about science and the hydrologic circle that had never happened before, cycles rather, you know, the rain comes down, it evaporates, goes back up, and, comes uh -huh. and that's still going on, of course. Right. You know, but that had never happened before. That's awesome. That relates to the very last scripture, too. We'll, we'll come back to that. So everything looks different, right? It's new, and whoo, thank goodness he got to open the window because it did not smell good on that ark, right? <laughs> you know that. So he takes off the covering, and he sees the new world. Noah and his family see the, the changes and the difference in the new world, and it's a picture of the new beginning. Revelation 21, 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Isn't that interesting that Revelation says that? Because when Noah looks out, the waters had abated. He's like, cool, no more sea. I can see the land. Um, the sky looks different. Everything was, was new. And it looked like, if we go back to uh, Genesis 1, the earth had a watery beginning, right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. He, he parts the waters and he brings the dry land out of the sea. And we see that same thing happening in uh, Genesis 8 when Noah comes out. He's emerging from the waters. And again, it's a picture to a, a believer emerging from the waters, walking into new life. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you read 14 to 22 um, to the end of the chapter for homework. But there's a couple of important things that I want to point out. Um, verse 14, it says, In the second month, on the 7 and 20th day of the month, was the earth dry. The 27th day of the second month. What's important about that? February 27th, that's Poppy's birthday! <laughs> <laughs> How lucky to have your birthday in the Bible, right? <laughs> yes. He was born that day, right? Is it the second Passover? No, nope, it's just yep. his birthday. That's the only reason I want to Oh, that's cute. I love that. So Noah is like Adam. Adam was the first man. Noah and his family, they have to replenish the earth. And um, let's finish with this. Diane pointed out the cycle, how now the sun causes the water to evaporate, go up and form clouds, and then rain onto the earth, and that cycle began, right? The very last verse in chapter 8, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So God is promising there's going to be a routine, seasons of harvest, day and night, that's going to continue. He was promising some stability um, to this new world. So next week, we will talk about uh, the Noahic covenant, or the covenant that God made with Noah and the rainbow, and that will be the first part of chapter 9. So did y'all hear about the lady that was boarding an airplane and had two ravens with her? And the lady said, you can't bring those birds on here. Why not? I'll let you carry on. <laughs> oh. Oh.